with uh, uh, the theme of the symposium. Uh, so my goal today is to introduce to, uh, to you all, in very general, broad terms, uh, the history of Tehran as a city and as a social space uh, within the modern history of Europe. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to describe for you how Tehran was transformed uh, during the second half of the 19th century uh, and how the city really took on a new role uh, in modern Iranian history. And this period that I'm focusing on, the second half of the 19th century, is, I think, a critical moment uh, in the history of Tehran as a city. It represents the moment when Tehran really began to take on the shape and the function uh, of what we consider to be a modern capital city of a modern nation in the new world. Uh, and similarly, and just as importantly, it was also during this period that Tehran became a kind of arena, a social arena, a political arena. Uh, for all sorts of things, demonstrations of government authority, as well as demonstrations of popular mobilization against government authority, and that's part of how we think of a modern city as well. Uh, today, of course, when we think of Tehran, we think of it as one of the world's mega cities. It's a, a city of over 12 million people, a uh, sprawling metropolis, uh, congested traffic, uh, lots of people. Uh, uh, kind of, in some way, a typical third world city, the way we think of that term. Uh, we may also think of Tehran uh, as uh, you know, in context of the social movements of the last century in, in Iran. Uh, the city of Tehran has been uh, an urban space uh, as a, an arena for popular mobilization during the, uh, the constitutional revolution of 1905, the oil nationalization movement of 1953, the Islamic revolution of 1979, and the, uh, the aftermath of the election. The city has always been an arena uh, for popular gathering and demonstrations and mobilization. Uh, all of these social movements have used the urban space of Tehran as a stage uh, for gathering large numbers of people to express grievances and so forth. And we don't need to only think about Tehran in this context. Very recently, of course, the, the social movements in the Arab countries, in Cairo in particular, once again, you see the city, in the case of Cairo, the Tahrir Square, becoming a kind of gathering place uh, for social mobilization. Uh, however, this type of popular mobilization, whether it's in Tehran or Cairo, is only made possible if the scale and shape and structure of the city is of a particular form, uh, essentially a modern form. And in the case of Tehran, it was during the late 19th century that the city began to be rebuilt and uh, become reshaped uh, to begin its history as a public space, as a public arena uh, that can function in some of these ways that we've seen in the more recent past. And in a sense, that's what I want to try to discuss with you, is how this transformation took place. Uh, and just describe it for you in some general way. Uh, I should say, prior to the late 19th century, uh, Tehran was in many ways a, a typical medieval Middle Eastern city. Uh, the city itself had only been the capital of Tehran really since the 18th century or the late 18th century. Tehran is not a city that has an ancient history like Baghdad or Damascus or Istanbul or Jerusalem. Uh, the city of Tehran was really only built in the form, or the beginnings of its modern form, the late 18th century, the beginning of the, the, the reign of uh, Abu Muhammad al Qajar, who was the founder of the monarch of the Qajar dynasty. Um, and it began to grow fairly quickly. This is a portrait of Fatali Shah, the second of the Qajar monarchs. And it was during this period, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, to the days of Fatali Shah's reign, uh, that the, the, the city began to, in a broad sense, uh, be established as a, as a city, with a, as a capital city of, of Tehran. Um, there was an earlier history of Tehran. It was, Tehran was a small village up until this point. Uh, but it's really in the late 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, that the city begins to grow and become a capital city. Let me show you some images and some maps of the city. Uh, during the late 19th or during the early 19th century. 
This is a map of Tehran from 1826. It's a Russian map. And this probably represents the first, to my knowledge, the first map of Tehran uh, from this period, uh, when after it was beginning to be established as a capital city. And, uh, and I'll describe for you, the city was defined by a number of basic features that I'd like to draw your attention to. The most noticeable uh, feature, there's probably more than one, but the most noticeable is the walls. which were built right in this period, early 19th century. Um, in the pre-modern period, uh, walls were, of course, meant, uh, it was a common feature of medieval Middle Eastern cities, the walls of the city. Uh, and in the pre-modern period, of course, cities were prone to invasion from neighboring empires and uh, maybe uh, marauding tribes and so forth. So the walls had always been a tool of defense in the city, and the city and the surrounding agricultural zone, you can see some of these plots of land, these are actually outside of the city walls, are some plots of land that are agricultural zones. And in the pre-modern period, you know, a, a Middle Eastern city was in some ways a kind of self-contained, uh, self-sufficient social, economic, environmental system. With the, with the city and its population and the surrounding agricultural lands being a kind of self-contained at the bottom of this image, you can also see the structure of the wall itself, and that's what you see here. This is a side view of the walls of the city. Um, and as you can see, I think I might even be able to show you a slightly bigger image of this. Uh, you can see the, wall, uh, the walls of Tehran are actually not all that impressive in the 19th century. Uh, they were really not much more than a mound of dirt that was situated next to a moat. Uh, and that's what this is. This is essentially a dugout ditch, uh, which uh, usually had water in it, or it might not have had any water in it. Uh, but this would essentially function as a, as a moat surrounding the city, and the wall was essentially a mound. Uh, and in that sense, Tehran's, the walls of Tehran, the early 19th century, were not particularly uh, impressive as defensive fortifications. And the reason for that probably has to do with the fact that Tehran was, by comparative standards with other Middle Eastern cities, a, a rather new city. And by the 19th century, uh, even the early 19th century, the, the prospect of invading armies coming across the deserts and the, the steppes and, and uh, climbing over the walls of the city. That was no longer a, a typical common pattern uh, compared to what uh, had been the pattern of warfare in the medieval period. By the early 19th century, in fact, uh, the new technology of artillery, cannons, greatly facilitated the defense of cities. The cities, in a sense, no longer needed insurmountable walls to protect them because the city would be surrounded by that building. And in some ways, that probably explains why Tehran, being essentially a 19th century city, uh, doesn't have a, a history of having a very extensive fortified walls other than what you see here. Um, other basic features that you can see from this, and I'm trying to show you this, this is another map of the city. Uh, one of the other basic features that you can see uh, from this, this is a map from 1852, also prior to the rebuilding of the city. This is another Russian map. Uh, but what you can see are a number of other features here. One is this central compound. This is the royal compound. And again, you can see the walls of the city. Tehran will be rebuilt in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, and I'll describe that for you as well. But this is Tehran as it looked in the first half of the 19th century. You can see the walls of that moat that I described for you. But this is another very important feature. This is a royal compound of the city. Uh, you can also see this is the bazaar district, adjacent to the royal compound. Uh, and you can also see, and I don't know if you can see it quite in this image, but I will show you another one, are 
behind the gates of the city, which was another typical, yeah, you can see it better in this image. Uh, these are the portals, the gates of the city. Uh, on these specific points around that walled enclosure, and again, you can see the, the royal compound in Adam, or the citadel, and this highlighted shaded area is the bazaar district uh, of the city. This is in the early half of the 19th century, this is what Tehran looked like. Uh, in the early 19th century, there were as few as five gates, and that's, I think, the number that you see here. There were only five gates leading into the city. Later, in the second half of the 19th century, this number will be greatly expanded in ways that I'll describe for you. Uh, the gates of the cities themselves, of the city of Tehran, were actually architectural works of art in, in some ways. And I have some images for you here. Uh, this is one of the gates leading into Tehran. I, I'm not exactly sure what period this was. This gate was uh, structured. This is the gate in the southern part of the city, uh, going to the uh, Dar al Zayda, the Shah al Azim, in the southern part of the city, leading to the gate going south. I believe. I'm trying to figure out the orientation. This might actually be heading into the city. You can almost see the the mound, the wall mound, in the background on the other side of the city here. Uh, the population, here's another gate for that famous Azadine gate. This I think is actually from a slightly later period, this photo. Uh, but this, from what I can tell, you can see the moat around the city and this mound and dirt, and then here is the gate of the city. And I believe this is heading into the city. So this is sort of outside the city. There's the road. Going through the gate, through the gate will be entering into uh, the city itself, and that is north. You can see the mountain range, the Alpha Mountains to the north. Uh, okay, one more image here. Yeah, this, here's another more detailed map of 1857 that shows the gates. That previous photo, this is the, the Lazine Gate, which is right here. And I think that the orientation of that photo is. Um, it was in the 1860s and 1870s that the transformation of Tehran began. Uh, and the population in this period was very relatively small. Tehran in the middle part of the 19th century probably had a population of maybe 50,000. I think that's maybe a generous number. Uh, the scale of this city itself is actually quite modest. I mean, maybe five square miles, something to that effect, in the first half of the 19th century, before the uh, extensive rebuilding of the city. Uh, and I think I might be able to show you a bit of a sense of that scale. This is a map of Tehran today. And if you can notice this red box here, this red box is essentially this. And it gives you a sense of how how much the city of Tehran has grown in the last century and a half to give you a, a, a sense of the scale of the growth and expansion of the city. Um, and this is the person who rebuilt this city. This is Nasruddin Shah. Uh, and it was Nasruddin Shah who you see in the days of his reign, uh, who reigned for a very long time, uh, who was the, the Majar monarch who really presided over the systematic expansion and rebuilding of the city during the second half of the 19th century. Uh, Nasser Big Shah, here's another photo of him. He was also an avid photographer. Uh, Nasser Big Shah was uh, it's a remarkable figure, a controversial figure. In some ways, uh, some historians say that he was uh, responsible for Iran's relative stagnation in the 19th century, especially compared to Egypt and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, which had really much more robust modernization programs uh, compared to Iran. Iran, by comparison to Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, the other major centers of Middle Eastern history and politics and culture in, in the region, Iran, by comparison, didn't have as robust a modernization effort. Uh, and some people uh, credit that sluggishness with Nasser Shah's personality. Uh, he's also sometimes criticized for signing unequal economic treaties with European investors that didn't help Iran's economic development. But 
uh, be that as it may, a number of significant ways that maybe he has received quite the kind of credit that he might deserve. Nazi Nishal was, in fact, a pioneer uh, in many respects uh, of Iran's modernization. Uh, he was the first Iranian monarch to travel overseas, <coughs> to travel abroad. Uh, you know, he traveled extensively to Europe, the first Iranian monarch to do so. In 1873, 1878, uh, and 1889, he made three very extensive tours of Europe where he traveled to Russia, Austria, Germany, France, Britain. Uh, and in each of these visits, uh, the, the influence, here's a, here's a photo or a sketch of uh, Nasser King Shah during his visit to London from the London Illustrated News. Uh, he became something of a uh, celebrity in Victorian London. Uh, during his travels to London. He was something of a curiosity and something of a celebrity. Uh, and so he made the front page of the, the London newspapers when he traveled there. But his visits during his European trips uh, really profoundly shaped his desire for modernizing Iran in a number of ways. And probably the most important impression that his European journeys had on Nasser Shah was it inspiring him to uh, engage and initiate urban reform. Um, it was the European imperial capital cities of Europe in the second half of the 19th century that really made a profound impression on Nasser Shah. Uh, in terms of the size and scale and form of the cities, uh, as well as their architectural beauty and the aesthetic experience of a kind of modern, bustling metropolis, uh, these were the things that inspired him, whether it was St. Petersburg, uh, Paris, uh, Vienna, uh, or even London. These were the cities that really inspired him. And this is actually another example of a uh, sketch art rendering from a, a Parisian weekly newspaper that shows Nasser Din Shah during his trip to Paris in 1873. And of course, there's the architecture now. And here's Nasser being shot in his carriage, riding into the center of town. And there was a reception that was held for him uh, at the Arc de Triomphe. And you can see the Arc is decorated with the Iranian flags and the lion sun insignia. Uh, and I always like to say that these renderings of sketch art, in a sense, predate photojournalism. And in a sense, that's what this is. Prior to photography being part of photojournalism, there was this earlier tradition of uh, sketch art that was part of uh, print media in the 19th century. So this gives you a sense of how you shall see in Paris, as it were. Uh, and the importance of seeing Paris for Nasser Din Shah was to inspire him to speed up the modernization of Iran. And it was from this experience that the rebuilding of Tehran began uh, during his reign. From the early 1870s onward, Nasser Din Shah set out to transform the size and the scale and the form of Tehran and to turn it into a, a model of a modern imperial capital city akin to the European capitals that he had visited. Uh, and the task for transforming Tehran in this way was given to the staff of the Royal College, the Daral Fadu. Uh, and the task was given to the Royal College to devise a plan for rebuilding the city in some ways, the same way maybe architects uh, are collaborating today to rebuild the law. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, Iranian and European architects collaborated at the Royal College uh, to rebuild Tehran. Uh, and let me briefly describe for you uh, some of the basic changes that came about as a result of this, this architectural uh, collaboration. Probably the biggest single change uh, as a result of this rebuilding was in the size of the city. Nasser Din Shah's plan to uh, rebuild Tehran included a plan to demolish the old, uh, the old city walls and to rebuild the city around a much larger uh, Parameter. And that's what you see here. These walls here were rebuilt. The original city 
walls extended into this region. This was that original uh, circumference of the city, the borders and the walls that I just showed you before. And those were torn down, and the walls of the city were rebuilt around this much larger perimeter that I described for you here. Uh, although the plan retained the concept of a walled city, uh, the new walls were built uh, to create a much larger urban space. Uh, the total territorial size of the city probably grew by, I don't know, I think at least 400% uh, from probably three or four square miles, which was the original city, to this much larger uh, circumference of the city, which may have been 15 or 20 square miles. Uh, so the size of the city, just in terms of acreage, if you will, uh, grew significantly. Also, the number of uh, gates uh, expanded dramatically as well. And here, you can count them up, and there's 12 gates all around the city. So from five gates to 12. Uh, this also allowed for a much larger population of the city. In 1850, the population of Tehran was probably about 50,000. And then, as I say, today, the population is over 12 million gives you a sense of the pace of growth. By 1900, uh, no, by 1890, the population of Tehran was probably about 150,000 people. That's probably a guess. Uh, but within a generation or two generations, the size of the city uh, tripled. Um, in addition to the expansion of the physical size of the city, the other important change that was also set in motion in the 1870s was what I would describe as the city's spatial. The old form of the city had been centered around uh, a traditional medieval model, which included basically the royal compound and the bazaar, was basically all that the city really was, this sort of bazaar, citadel axis, uh, which was typical of a medieval city. Uh, the expansion of the city in the 1870s now allowed for the center of the city to become a public gathering place. And this is kind of a key transformation that I think I'm trying to emphasize for you. Uh, the formal citadel now became a public royal compound, uh, and that's essentially what you see here. Uh, this became a public gathering place. Uh, the other areas of the city now increasingly became residential districts. Uh, these were areas that were formerly outside of the city walls, especially in this northern region. This became the, essentially the beginnings of the, the new suburbs, if you will. Uh, but now they have been incorporated into the perimeter of the walls of the city now to uh, include them. So the spatial arrangement of the city became modernized with a public center, and the growing residential districts of the peripheral areas uh, surrounding the city. Uh, another innovation that goes along with this is the building of new streets and new boulevards uh, that now tie together this much larger area together. And that's what you see here. This is, this is a famous 19th century painting of what one of these pedestrian streets in Tehran looked like after the rebuilding of the city in the Nasserine Shah period. And we a slightly larger rendering of it here. Um, very reminiscent of 19th century European boulevards that were built in Paris and other European capitals during this period. Long, straight streets that would cut through the city from the outskirts of the residential districts. Uh, leading into the central compound, the royal compound in the center of the city. And that's essentially what you're seeing here. There was also the beginning of public transportation systems in the second half of the 19th century, and that's what you see here as well. Uh, some of the most important ones were these tramways, these horse-drawn tramways that were uh, the beginnings of public transportation in the city, uh, as well as some uh, Uh, another part of the urban renovation 
was the building of the the Maidan, the Maidan of Tuhane, which was uh, the artillery square, uh, right adjacent to the royal compound. This was something that Nasser bin Shah established that he built. Uh, it was also a very modern innovation. Uh, it was a place for public ceremonies and military parades. Uh, I think here's another image of it. Uh, military parades were one of the ceremonies that Nasruddin Shah had uh, witnessed during his trips to Europe. And the idea of a central square as a kind of display of artillery was also something he had experienced during his European travels. Uh, also inspired by his European tours, Nasruddin Shah was the first Iranian head of state to build a statue to himself. Uh, and this practice of statuary, uh, this practice of statuary became uh, obviously very common in the 20th century, uh, as it was common in both Iran and in Europe. And in a sense, this is where Nasruddin Shah was again inspired by this European urban model uh, during his trips to Europe, seeing uh, especially equestrian statues uh, to the great uh, monarchs of Europe, and whether it was uh, Peter the Great. But there would certainly be these kinds of royal statuaries in front of the, the imperial cities of Europe. And Nasruddin Shah uh, was the first uh, Iranian monarch to build uh, a statue in this way. I should add that the statue, this is the statue that you see here, is sort of a, sim a singular example of this. Uh, because this statue was only very briefly displayed in public, uh, sometime in the 18th and it immediately raised concerns and protests, from, especially from Iranian clerics, who objected to the statue, uh, because for various reasons, including that uh, certain forms of representational art, of course, are forbidden in Islam. And on that basis, uh, the statue was removed from public view. And that's what you see here. This is Nasser Din Shah's equestrian statue uh, in a in garden in the royal compound which was then removed from here and brought into a kind of uh, courtyard enclosure that was outside away from public view. Um, let me describe one more new feature uh, of Tehran that was also established by Nasruddin Shah. And that was the building, uh, the construction of the Takya Dolat, uh, the Royal Amphitheater. Uh, this was a public theater, a Royal Amphitheater that was built by Nasruddin Shah as a performance space uh, that would bring large numbers of people onto the royal compound, that was built on the royal compound, for various performances. It probably had room for maybe two or three thousand spectators. And this is what you see here. Uh, this royal amphitheater, as we call it, was inspired by two types of institutions. Uh, the first institution that inspired this structure was a traditional Iranian ceremonial space that was traditionally used for the performance of the Tazia religious ceremony, uh, which was a form of public theater, or sometimes described as a passion play, that commemorates the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and the third Imam of Shiism. And traditionally, the, the Tazia passion play performances would be staged in public places, either on the streets, in public places, or sometimes in neighborhood makeshift performance areas uh, that were called takyas. Uh, the takya toilet, uh, the one that Nasruddin Shah built, was the biggest of all the takyas. Uh, it had uh, C4, as I say, several thousand spectators. It, it actually no longer exists uh, because it was, it was destroyed in the 19th as part of the later city we were rebuilding. But it became a gathering place for religious and political ceremonies that Nasruddin Shah began to organize in the 1880s. Uh, in this way, Nasruddin Shah was in the first head of state to begin staging public events that can be described as intended to legitimize his rule. Uh, he would preside over these kinds of performances, and I think there's a, another famous painting from this period that shows the interior of this Tazia, with the, uh, the spectators around this essential stage and sitting in the, uh, in the seats in the various uh, uh, levels of the amphitheater. 
Um, and here's a, a photograph of the Takia, uh, the interior of it. And you can see this is a photo for us. I think it's not even be a sketch art. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But this is with the cover of the roof withdrawn. It had a removable canvas roof that could be put in place or removed. Uh, in the image of it for you here. This is the scaffolding where the canvas uh, would be placed over the scaffolding to create shade on the roof. And here's another photograph of it. The exterior. This is probably the best photograph of the of the uh, Takia that we have on the Royal Palm um, So this awareness of the public to invite the public onto the Royal Compound as a kind of a gathering place of ceremonies and rituals to very often uh, aggrandize and legitimize the authority of the Shah. This was a very important part of why the Takia was so important. Uh, I'll, I'll add a little bit more here. I'm almost done. Yeah. I'm almost done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Takia Gulat was inspired by two institutions. One was what I just described for you, the Takia Performance Hall. But the other was this This is the Royal Albert Hall of London. And this was the other great public space that inspired Nasser Bouchard to build uh, the Taxi Building uh, on the Royal Compound. This is the Royal Albert Hall, which was uh, built and inaugurated in 1871, two years before Nasser Shah traveled to London. This is the Royal Albert Hall as it looks today in the photograph. This is a photo of, of Nasruddin Shah uh, at the opera at the Royal Albert Hall during one of his visits to, to London. Uh, so I'm running out of time, but let me, let me just try to sum this up by saying that all of this should give some context to the modernization of Tehran. From a, a pre-modern uh, Middle Eastern city to its beginning as a modern capital city, and everything that is associated with that kind of modernization. Modern cities or a stage where heads of state try to symbolize and promote their rule. Uh, but at the same time, modern cities also became an urban space for the mobilization of the public uh, to protest the authorities of government. This is the uh, uh, Tupane Square in the 1940s, moving forward very briefly. Uh, but this idea that the central of the city can become a gathering place is, of course, also something that in the 20th century becomes a very important part of the life of Tehran as a city. This is uh, 1953, this is 1979, uh, and this is 2009. The same, the same location, basically. Uh, this equestrian statue uh, was brought down uh, during all of these popular social movements of the 20th century. And that became part of the life of Tehran as well. Uh, but that is a history that comes much later after Nasruddin Shah's era. And it's probably something that he never really conceived of 